You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and today I have the huge privilege of speaking with the award-winning investment industry commentator Janet Moy. CFA Qualified Janet is the Head of Market Analysis at Bruin Dolphin and is a voting member of Bruin Dolphin's Asset Allocation Committee. Janet has over 15 years of experience in macro research and was previously the Global Economist at Casanova Capital. Janet is responsible for the commentary and communication of Bruin Dolphin's macro investment views to clients and the media and is a frequent guest on the BBC, Sky News, Bloomberg, CNBC. Janet won the Best Industry Commentator Award at the 2001 City of London Wealth Management Awards. And Janet has a first class degree in economics from the London School of Economics and an MBA finance at Cambridge University. Wow. And also named one of LinkedIn's top voices in finance for 2022, Janet. So thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Peter, for having me. Really delighted to be here. Now, I know you were on the news again this morning. So I'm very, very pleased and thrilled for you to be joining me today. I wanted to start, if I may, yeah. um, Janet, with asking you, um, you know, you've, you're very busy. You're on, you're on Bloomberg recently. And um, first, I want to share with you, share with us, what led you to the world of economics and the investment industry? Yeah, I've always been fascinated by macroeconomics because, you know, when, when I was a, a teenager, you, you read the news and you read uh, all about the stock market. I found it fascinating. And uh, I chose to study economics in my uni- university degree, uh, especially loving the macroeconomics aspect because it's so related to our daily lives, right? I want to know more about finances, you know, uh, investing. Uh, it, it's all very interesting stuff to me. And I feel that in real life, actually working in finance is even more interesting than the studying itself. Uh, you know, looking at the markets every day, uh, is, uh, you know, it can be volatile at times. You learn so much. And I think personally speaking, it is very beneficial as well because you learn more about investing. I'm so glad I'm in the, this industry because I feel that, Financial education is a bit lagging. And I feel that, you know, I'm very lucky to be in the industry for a long time. So I managed to, you know, save and invest early on. And that really has been very beneficial. And I feel very lucky because of that. Brilliant. Love that reply. Now, I'm intrigued because one of your qualifications is a postgraduate certificate in ecometrics at Berkeley, at Burbeck College, sorry. So tell me about that and explain to me what that actually is about, that specialism. Yeah, so econometrics is a quantitative study and analysis of economics. So, I mean, economics, it can be qualitative analysis uh, and also quantitative. So quantitative is basically exploring the relationship between different economic variables. It helps you make a prediction to the best of the ability, depending depending on historical data. It's not always perfect, but it gives you a a general sense. So you know about uh, the different techniques and you use the statistical package because you you cannot do it by hand. So there are many statistical packages to help you do it. So a lot of um, economists would would use that, uh, helping with forecasting, uh, you know, things like GDP, inflation, or even direction of uh, markets. Uh, it, it is very uh, beneficial. Uh, I did a one year part time study because I was actually working and I, I did, you know, a, a few evenings per week. Uh, and it has been helpful. Brilliant. Now, obviously, all those, all that analysis and quanti- quantifying all of this, all what's going on around the world is vitally important right now. We seem to be having a whole flux and array of things going on. Now, given what we know of what we've seen at the moment, what are your current thoughts regarding the markets, the volatility, the turbulence? What are your current thoughts about it all? Yeah, I think I think a very important change this year is that a lot of the positive drivers for markets are just going into reverse. Right. We have very supportive monetary policy, uh, fiscal stimulus, 
uh, we have very strong growth, right? All the reopening and pent up demand. So it was a very positive story. But then this year, everything going to reverse. So we're in a much more difficult environment and it could last uh, as long as inflation is high. So there is a real risk that inflation is uh, staying more elevated than people anticipated. Um, so we do think that markets are getting more difficult and you know people are so comfortable and so used to the high returns previously when we have ultra uh, low uh, interest rates, but it is going to be a bit tougher. And I think people need to manage expectations. Yeah, thank you. I, I completely agree with you. Now, please give us an overview of the sheer scale and importance of your role and responsibilities at Bruin Dolphin, please. Yeah, I, I think my role is really, really interesting. It's my dream job, I think. I think because uh, I, I'm a, you know, I have an economist background. Uh, I link economics with investment strategy. So we ha you have a lot of discussion every day about uh, asset allocation, tactical and strategic. And that basically forms uh, the basis of how we manage our portfolios. And we manage you know, over 60 billion of assets right, for, for our clients. So it is a hu hugely important role. Of course, you know, the decisions are taken within a committee. So it's a gr group decision. But uh, our team plays a very important role in formulating those macro strategies. So I really enjoy that. Uh, and also have a lot of client facing and media facing element, which I really appreciate because you, you don't always get those roles because you either do, you know, you focus on the quantitative aspect managing the portfolio or you do a lot of the, uh, you, you're the private banker, you go and talk to clients, right? So I, I love that it is a mix of uh, both worlds in terms of, you know, speaking to clients about our strategy and also actually behind the scene uh, managing all these portfolios. Now, obviously, you, you, you're on the, the TV and the media quite a lot, but please tell us about the investment services that Bruin Dolphin provides for all of its different clients. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. So we're a wealth manager. We're one of the biggest in the UK. And we, I think the, the special thing about Bruin Dolphin is that we really do serve a wide spectrum of clients. So uh, a lot of people have the impression that a uh, wealth manager only serves the very rich, uh, very wealthy people. You, you, you know, people have the impression that, oh, I need to have a million pounds in the bank to get served. But, you know, with technology, I think things are really changing. We serve uh, clients from all spectrum, uh, whether you have, I don't know, a thousand pounds to invest or you have a monthly savings plan of a hundred pounds, you know, there are solutions that, that could work. And, you know, depending on your risk profile, you can choose the uh, right portfolio for you. It's all, you know, being managed by us, managed by our team, uh, ready-made portfolio, diversified, uh, lots of choices. Um, and, so we have four uh, different uh, client target, depending on, on the wealth spectrum. Uh, we, we're very proud that we can serve uh, people from a very diverse background. Uh, and I think um, uh, we really take pride in that because I don't think many wealth managers can, can proudly say that they serve all spectrum of clients. Okay. Now, I, I'm intrigued because I'm, uh, I volunteer and support several charities and I'm an ambassador for one charity as well. So I'm um, intrigued about the, um, the services that you provide for charities. Could you expand on that for me, please? Yeah, we also uh, manage portfolios for charities. So uh, that's institutional clients. Uh, obviously, they would have quite a different uh, needs because they, they have the spending criteria and they have a much longer time horizon as well. So we have a dedicated team, uh, also one of the biggest in the UK that specifically manage charity clients. Um, so we, we basically, we serve individuals, institution, charities, uh, intermediaries, et cetera. So really wide spectrum of clients and, um, each division has experience in serving that particular clientele. As I, as I mentioned, every client has those particular needs and charity is one of them. Thank you very much. Now, March, 2020, just, what was it? two months after your brilliant promotion and you got your dream job, RBC stepped in and said, we love what Bruin Dolphin are doing. We'd love to buy you, become a larger part, well, part of a larger group, RBC, Canada. Does that mean we're going to lose you from our shores? You know, you, you're working in the Midlands, you're doing work at Cambridge University. You were you graced Leicester many moons ago when you went to Leicester Castle Business School. 
what does it what does it mean going forward for Bruin Dolphin this this merger this takeover? Yeah, well, it is going to be positive, obviously, uh, with the synergy of both uh, very good brand names out there, and obviously, RBC offers a, a more international platform. Uh, I think we have yet to be see uh, seeing how the merger will work going forward. I think a lot of work is uh, being done at the background, and I don't, I don't think there is a lot to disclose at the moment. You know, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not supposed to disclose, and I don't think I know more than what is being published out there available uh, publicly. But we we do feel very encouraged and very excited about the outlook because um, we we have a very strong investment solutions and that's very attractive proposition and uh, the merger will allow us to further uh, broaden the distribution of those investment solutions so it is a very great uh, opportunity for us to expand further in terms of distribution and of course I think you know getting the expertise potentially from the whole RBC group you know they have very strong analyst team in you know all the major asset classes but I think from from that knowledge and research point of view is I think it's very powerful so that will ultimately be very beneficial to our clients. Thank you now Janet you've got a, a great interest and passion for um, all things ESG and ESG investments what are your thoughts regarding the ESG sector the growth and also what's happening in the, uh, the capital markets regarding it? Yeah, well, I think ESG is an unstoppable trend. Um, I think it is getting increasingly clear, right? I think from the regulatory point of view, we are just getting more and more regulation demand for um, ESG-related uh, disclosure and more investments will be going to the field. I think the, the war in Ukraine further accelerates the shift to green energy, so that certainly helps with the E. Uh, environmental related investment is really the the key of the ESG investment so far because is the investment theme of environmental is is just more apparent than the S or the G. Or, so uh, I think more 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 and more and more investment will be going to the renewables. This is unstoppable, right? With everyone trying to transition away from fossil fuel and more so with the war uh, going on, uh, it will be a Multi-year process is not going to be near-term. You know, near-term growth style is suffering at the moment. So the ESG-related style also uh, related to the growth style is also suffering. But the longer-term trajectory remains intact, uh, supporting from both a you know consumer preference point of view, regulatory point of view, and just the, the need to transition to green energy. So very, I think we're very positive on the sector. Okay, so. The FCA published the ESG integration to UK capital markets report recently, to which Richard Stone, the chief executive of the Association of Investment Companies, responded, it's vital that investors can trust ESG data and ratings which are increasingly used in investment decision making. So we strongly support the FCA's view that greater regulatory oversight is essential to provide reliable and objective information. How is the regulatory status quo at the moment and does it need to be improved yeah i think uh there's still i think a lot of uh, discussion uh and uh lack of clarity on the standardization of how you look at esg right uh there's there are a number of providers that uh, provide some more quantitative analysis of esg but i don't think there's really a gold standard like a standardized approach that is approved by a single body that is applied globally. It, it is just not there. So I think a lot is still up to the investor's interpretation itself. So that makes uh, the, the caliber of those ESG professionals so important. You know, there can be a wide disparity of those uh, people in the field, but those who really know what they're doing versus those who may be very likely to subject to greenwashing potentially, which is increasingly a problem and which is being really actively invested by regulators more and more so. So I think uh, there is opportunity when there is such a uh, discrepancy and lack of clarity going on. So the, the best uh, of the field will certainly benefit from the trust of the public. And uh, I think, yeah, definitely more needs to be done in order to um, create that trust trust in the public. Uh, 
you know, I love that reply. Now, can you share with us how Bruin Dolphin are working within that space and what you and your team are doing on the ESG front, please? Yeah, certainly. We integrate ESG uh, in our investment process. So it's a, it's a few pillars, really. It's like uh, we consider ESG criteria in all our investment aspects. We also offer more specific ESG-driven uh, investment that people, you know, they when they have a higher uh, standard or they, they really want specific ESG goals, then they, they can also access those investments. We have a dedicated team to select the funds and put them together in, in a portfolio uh, that people can choose. I mean, also corp from a corporate perspective, we also, you know, we are dedicated to ESG. Like we, we sign up for net zero. Um, so, uh, so it's really embedded in both from an investment perspective or whether you're talking about day-to-day, -day, the running of the corporation perspective. Uh, and we have expanded our team in, in the ESG uh, area. Uh, and uh, we also have many processes. You, you mentioned about the trust. So we have a number of processes in place like controversy tracking, for example, that really enables us to distinguish between the genuine uh, ESG focused companies versus those who are not. Brilliant. I love that response. Now, I was going to ask this a bit, a bit later, but I'll ask it now. You mentioned net zero, and obviously along with the ESG, that's one of the most talked about sort of um, trends at the moment. How best would you say that, e that ESG and then net zero should be measured? Because it's where do you start and where does it end, the measurements of net zero? Yeah, it is, uh, it is difficult to quantify, but I think there are more and more ways that you can try to quantify it uh, at the moment. I think uh, for a financial services company like us, we, we actually don't produce too much carbon com in comparison to the firms that, you know, are directly, you know, producing stuff or those who are actually, you know, in mining or energy specific. So uh, we, we will, I mean, if you're taking us as an example, it will be about the, uh, for example, the travel, like the carbon footprints that we have when our employees travel, for example, uh, of course, all the you know electricity that we use in the company. So there would be ways that we can measure those carbon footprint approximately, and we will look at the ways that how we can actually reduce those carbon footprints. You know, uh, for example, how we can travel more efficiently. You know, taking trains versus taking planes, or whether you can we can also do more video calls instead of you know staff traveling around. So those are ways that we can do it. And of course. Uh, energy efficiency in the building. We are constantly, I think we have a team corporate responsibility that actually looks at the way we run the business and look at operations, identify areas where we can reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, yeah, that, those are the things that uh, we can do. Uh, as a financial service company, uh, thankfully we are not the biggest producers of carbon footprint. Uh, so we, we, are, yeah, we, we are looking at ways that we can further minimize the impact. Brilliant. Now, Janet, you're one of the leading women in the wealth management industry where your insights are sought after. And you, you were asked to present, talk, deliberate, be on panels for, for events all around the world. I want to talk at the minute because we're trying to motivate so many young women to get into STEM, to get into finance, to get into industries which are male dominated. I want to ask you, if I may, what are you most proud of what you've achieved regarding leading uh, for, for women in the industry so far? Yeah, I, I feel really proud because, um, as you say, there is really a lack of women. Actually, I, I'm from Hong Kong, I'm Chinese, and uh, especially in the UK, really a lack of Asian women. Uh, I think most of the time when I go into client meetings, uh, presentations, seminars, uh, mostly men, uh, very, very few women, I'm very proud that actually uh, they're listening to me. So I'm actually, you know, going there, giving them the talk, informing them, and they're all listening to me. You know, I'm the expert there. So I, I'm really, really proud of doing that job because it's not easy. I feel like uh, throughout my career, um, it, it is I need to make more effort to be recognized. I, I feel that I need to work a lot harder for me to be regarded. Even if, for example, I say the same thing as a man, I think that 
people subconsciously would place a higher weight to the things that guy say. I think that's my impression. Uh, that's just my personal experience. I'm not saying everyone is experiencing that. So I feel I always have to work harder um, to achieve uh, what I deserve. So I, I'm very proud that I managed to, and I, indeed I worked very hard. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I did all the qualifications. I did the ESG certificate um, from CFA, and I did the part-time econometrics course uh, right after I did the uh, brutal CFA. So I, I, I really put a lot of effort and I worked very hard, and I'm very proud of the achievement. Yeah, and, and, and clearly that's been recognised by the team and the, the, yeah. the, the, the other leaders of Brewing Dolphin because you got that, you know, your, your dream job, you got promoted in, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in January of this year. So congratulations on that front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank now, you. Yeah, I'm very glad. Yeah, very glad and really very supportive organisation. Yeah, um, and it's growing. You know, you've got, you've got advisors across 32 office networks. Yeah. Um, Janet. So that's a big team. Yeah, that you're... it's such a great team spirit here. It is such a great. I'm very happy to, to work here. Everyone has the, the the goal to serve our client in the best interest, and we all we all very passionate at what, what we do. So I think you can see it in the results, right? Uh, absolutely. So. absolutely. I've met I've met some of your colleagues, and they always look happy regarding what they're doing and loving their job. So that's a good culture to have in a in a large yeah. team, isn't it? It, now, it is I'm, a great I'm, culture. Yeah, br brilliant. Now, regarding experience, right? Aldous Huxley is an English writer and philosopher, and he wrote, experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. I wanted to ask you, if you'd be so kind, to share with our listeners one of the significant experiences of your investing career, what it was, what you did as a consequence, and how it has shaped your thinking and your career so far? Yeah, um, I think, well, uh, since my career started in the city of London, um, I think, yeah, there, there are quite a few memorable moments. Uh, I think, well, I witnessed the um, abenomics, uh, which I remember, I still remember, everyone was so pessimistic on Japan. I mean, rightly so, because it, it was in deflation for such a long period, you know, the last decade, and then Abenomics came. And then, um, I mean, initially, people didn't, didn't feel as optimistic. But then actually, you, you look at the drivers, like all the monetary and the fiscal stimulus, etc. It was, you know, the structural reforms It's really unprecedented. It's really amazing. And I think that at that point in time, I was still quite junior. And I was talking to my boss, you know, we should buy, you should buy Japan is, is, you know, is an opportunity is something that is quite exciting going forward. But I don't think people actually were buying into that because they were so used to that mindset of, oh, this deflation, stagflation, a st stagnation, sorry, stagnation, no growth, that bad demographics, even though actually, you know, there are a lot of reasons why you should actually be buying Japan at that point. Um, I, I just feel that sometimes with the city of London, I think some fresh minds uh, should be appreciated because I think some people are, were so stuck in that mindset. Just like, for example, right now, we had, we had very high inflation, right? And I remember last year, everyone was saying, yeah, inflation is transitory because no one believed that there will be high inflation because there, is, there was quantitative easing, you know, there was always money printing, but there was no inflation. So everyone got stuck like, yeah, interest rates will remain at zero for the foreseeable future. Inflation is going to be low no matter what happens. I think people sometimes need to refresh their mindset and don't get stuck uh, where they were. I, told, I completely understand that when they had that experience for years, it didn't change. Uh, but, you know, there will be times when actually things turn a corner. I think some people are just too stuck sometimes and they really need to think more differently i think i, I agree with this there's a far too much issue regarding fixed mindsets yeah, um, yeah within yeah. within the industry and other, other other industries as well i think we need to broaden our horizons and think d deeper and like you say bring in some fresh faces with different viewpoints i think that enables yeah. the markets to create a little bit of liquidity and fluidity now you mentioned um earlier about this being your dream job 
Now, I wanted to ask you about um, being a role model for, for younger for younger girls. I want, I've asked it slightly already, but I wanted to ask again, because my, my daughter is, has been mm-hmm. saying to me since the, year, the age of 11, she wants to be an architect, right? And you said at an early age, you, you wanted to get into finance and, and maths. Which routes are you most passionate about regarding the industry for a young woman wanting to become the next Janet Moy? Um, you, you mean like the field of study, like where? The field, field of study, but also the career path possibly. Well, I'm a bit biased though. Like, uh, I, I personally, okay, I think economics, I think economics is really the basis of how the city functions. I think you need to really understand economics to, to be in any good roles in the city. Right. Um, you, you can be an economist. Of course, that requires economic knowledge. If you're a fund manager, you need to look at the economy. If you're a stock analyst, arguably, you look at the macro less, but you also need to understand the dynamics. Uh, I think having a good sense of economics is hugely important in any part of the city. It is a fundamental and it's good for yourself as well, good for your personal development, good for your you know, savings, investment attitude. So I'm biased. I think uh, economics uh, knowledge is very important. It forms the fundamentals of many, many roles in the city. Uh, if you look at the career path of many successful city people, a lot of them have the economic background. And then they, after they, they have the solid foundation, they can choose to be you know, a fund manager, they can be a strategist, they can be a stock analyst. Yeah, yeah I think it, it really brought, it gives open doors for you, shall I say. But of course, I think... Uh, I mean, do whatever you're, you're passionate about. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for that. Now, Jenna, I want to ask a little bit about your own personal investing, if I may, regarding your own investing style, what you do with your ISO, if you have one, et cetera, so we can find out where, where your thinking is and how that differs regarding the, um, the market cycles. Yeah, yeah. So um, my investment philosophy is that... Um, I, I mean, I save every month and then I, I buy, I, I would, I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't keep a lot of cash. I keep the cash that is necessary to sustain my outgoing for, I don't know, maybe six to 12 months. And then I invest the rest. I always make sure that I am invested. Uh, I think, for example, now with the market, you know, coming down so much, it is actually a good opportunity. Right. For me, it, it, it is. I, I don't care if the market actually goes down by another five to 10 percent. I know that when I put money in regularly, monthly now, I know that in a few years time, my money would be more than it is now. I'm, I'm pretty confident about that, uh, having seen the market cycle. So I think uh, I, I always put my investment in various areas. Right. So um, I would have. Uh, exposure to growth style stocks, for example, quality growth, because I know that those companies will do well regardless of whether we're going into a recession. Uh, I also have uh, defensive like gold. I will have some gold. Um, and I also have some bonds. I mean, just typical diversification, right? Because I, I'm in the industry. I know what I need to do. And of course, I also have portfolios with burned open. I also invest my money with burned open. Uh, because I know how good our team is. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a matter of um, savings. I think saving is very important. Uh, don't spend uh, outside of your, your means. I think that's very important. Um, yeah, always save for the future and invest those. Uh, and actually market downturns is very good entry point, actually. You don't don't panic, and uh, if you're young, if you're young, actually, you can afford to to wait and be be very patient. Good, thank you, for, thank you for that. Now, I wanted to ask and dig a bit deeper regarding your investing style, and ask for the benefit of our um, investors. Um, how do you go about choosing, selecting, filtering the quality companies that you choose? How do you go about that process? Yeah, yeah, sure. So. Um, well, quality company, what is good quality company? They are those companies that have a long-term good growth prospect. And those companies, usually they have good network effect. 
they are the, the top players in their field, very hard to replace. They have good pricing power. Like even with inflation now, they, they can e easier pass on their cost to consumers. Um, they typically uh, dominant. They're very dominant in their field and uh, they have very good balance sheet though. So they have a lot of cash in their accounts which they can deploy actually when, you know, actually when we have a recession, there are lots of good buying opportunities. And those companies would have the cash to actually go and buy other companies, right? So good, like cash in the bank, uh, good long-term prospect, good pricing power. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't name the names, but, you know, there will be some, the top players in that particular field that would fit those criteria. I think those would be the, the first steps that you can try to filter out uh, that that those investments will make me able to sleep at night, no matter whether we go into a recession or not. <laughs> it's important you've said there about um, being able to sleep at night. I think it's important yeah. that people are not distressed when they're, they're having investments or they're in the wrong investments for say. Now, we're, we're experiencing a great deal of turbulence, which you've mentioned earlier, and increased volatility at the moment due to rising interest rates you've mentioned Um rising inflation, energy costs, geopolitical um, conflicts, etc. During such difficult times, the best course of action is usually take a deep breath and focus on one's long-term investment goals, which you've mentioned before. Um, however, this is easier said than done for, for many inexperienced investors. As an experienced econo economist and investment strategist, Janet, what advice would you give to long-term investors at this time about staying calm? Yeah, it is, it is, of course, easier said than done. Uh, it's just human psychology. We are all, uh, we have lost aversion, right? We don't want to lose money. Uh, so it is natural uh, to acknowledge that you're, you're, you are fearful of the current uh, market drawdown. Uh, I think you, you can look at a long-term chart of the S&P 500. Uh, back then, when we had the global financial crisis, the market tanked. Uh, and then if you look back, the market has more than double, right? Yeah, it, it, I mean, this is just, this is what market does, volatility. But long term, remember, the market, by being in the market, you're investing in companies' earnings, right? So typically, company earnings, they grow in line with GDP growth. They typically does so if you say if you invest in a broad index uh, let's not let's forget like you're in the bit like investing in a single stock that's super risky i'm just i'm saying that if you invest in a broad index you typically invest in that country's gdp growth right unless you expect well gdp growth is going to decline every year then you know typically nominal gdp growth do grow over time you know, unless we're in a recession, but we won't be in a recession every year, right? So typically the long-term trend is still growth. So if you believe in that, then fundamentally, if you invest in those companies, you enjoy those growth, right? So I, I think that's a very important reminder that uh, if you invest, it's basically investing in the company's profit, which typically grows over time. And the recession is typically just a uh, a short period of time you, you don't actually tend to see recession often right uh mostly it is steady growth over time um so i think keep that in mind then uh you you will feel better and historically speaking indeed markets recover right remember the the most recent COVID fall it was very scary it was very i was looking at the screen down basically circuit breaker every day and then Look at how the market has rebounded very swiftly. If you imagine if you sold at the bottom, that would be very painful. Well, I'm not saying that this time around it will recover as quickly, but it will eventually. It will take, probably take longer time compared to the COVID, but the worst that you can do is to sell at the bottom. You'll come to regret it. It's, it's actually best not to do anything and just ride it out. I love that response. Now, the, the very important aspect of what you just said there, is about the market psychology aspect of it and the staying calm of it. How much importance do you think investors should put on regarding psychology? Because it doesn't seem to be enough um, regarding that at the moment. There's lots of panic and fear. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the media has something to do about it as well. Uh, constant, 
constant negativity. Kind of is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you read about the gloom, if you read about the inflation every day, it is kind of self-fulfilling in in a way. I think uh, made worse by social media nowadays. So I I can totally understand the panic. I think、uh, another way would be if you want to sleep at night and you you don't feel confident. I think it's best leaving it to an expert to help you manage the money if you're really that concerned, because that expert would. Take all the burden of the worry from you. He will have the res- he or she will have the responsibility to look after your portfolio. Make sure, make sure we're doing the best to smooth out the volatility, minimize the risk given your risk appetite. Um. So if you really, really are so concerned and really not confident in managing your own money, I think it's it's best to give it to an expert. Uh. I think it's it's worthwhile doing that. Uh. And in terms of the psychology, um, it is. Yeah, it's very hard. Everyone has their own feelings, have has their own emotions. So what we do at Burn Dolphin is that when there are times of stress like this, we will communicate more. We'll hold our clients' hands more because we know this is the time that they need us the most. Just like the COVID time, it was so it was so volatile. I did the most number of presentations ever that year. You know we're there when when the clients need us. I think the communication part is absolutely important.、Uh, there there's never too many communication when there is t- a volatile period. Yeah, you know, the best we can do is to hold our client hands. We can't. I mean, it's out of our control. The client's emotion. Everyone has their own emotion psychology. We we will do our best to soothe those、uh, nerves. Brilliant! I love that. I love that response. I love what you're saying about the the art of communication and being、mm. there for your clients. I think it's so important, especially when, at times of stress as well, to to be able to do that. Now, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about the the, the side of it regarding investing and it, with regards to the volatility we've got now. Are you an advocate,、um, Janet, or or is Bruin Dolphin an advocate for pound cost averaging, or are you more of an advocate for lump sum investing?、Uh, I think.、Uh... Investing on a monthly basis is a good idea for most people. You know,、uh, if you're you're you're、uh, the average population, you earn a salary, you you save, and then every month you're left with、uh, a chunk of money. I think it makes sense to do that because it tends over time it tends to smooth out the volatility.、Uh, so I think that's that really works for most people、uh, under any circumstances.、Uh, For lump sum, you I think you need to be you need to make a bigger call right every time you invest that lump sum.、Um, so I think if you if you're keen to do the lump sum investing, it's best to research more, to talk to people more, to understand more. So there's just inherently a higher risk of the timing of that lump sum.、Uh, so I think for the average population, I think.、Um, Averaging works well, and you know, with technology, it is actually is much cheaper now to regularly invest. You know, the transaction costs have come down a lot,、uh, the trading costs come down, so it it could be worth doing that.、Uh, if you have a lump sum, is、uh, depending on the size of the lump sum, it could be a very big decision. It's best to seek professional advice、um, if, if that's the case. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Now I wanted to ask you two two last questions here. Firstly,、um, Bruin Dolphins' macro outlook, given that what we've got going on at the moment regarding the, the turbulence、um, all around. And、yeah, I'll go with that question first, and I'll ask you the the second question. What's your what's your macro outlook at the moment, given all the noise, all the volatility? Yeah, clearly the macro outlook has deteriorated, especially if we are seeing these massive rate hikes in the US. Well, basically,、uh, well, slowdown is unavoidable and、uh, high risk of a recession.、Um, and this is just typical for a cycle when the Fed raises interest rates. You know, the economy usually slows down, and that's exactly the purpose because they want to bring down inflation. So I think the macro outlook is that we are going to see slower growth, more downward growth revisions. Uh, especially in the euro area, we are very concerned about the、uh, cutoff potential cutoff of Russian gas to Europe. I think people were thinking it is a terrorist. It could potentially materialize in the winter. You know, 
Russia may well weaponize this uh, this leverage, right? So I think the macro outlook is getting gloomier. Um, having said that, we think that the slowdown or if there's a recession, it will be a mild one, primarily because this is a typical cycle, which is triggered by higher interest rates. Nothing more sinister than that is not the financial crisis when you have uh, the combination of a failure of the housing market and a systemic failure of the banking system. So that is a very powerful failure of, from all sides. So this time around, we're not anticipating that. So it's a, it's a typical cycle of where the central banks fighting inflation, very high inflation, higher interest rates, economic slows down. Once inflation comes down, hopefully, um, central banks can actually embark on cutting interest rate. And typically, in a, a bull market starts when interest rates are starting to be cut. So um, yeah, that's our micro law. I think near term pain, but we don't think it is going to be as bad. Thank you. Now you you mentioned um, the U European markets and what's going on regarding all of that and the difficulties that may have. One of the one of the problems and recurring problems I, I see and read about is that as investors, especially UK investors, we're very UK centric. So obviously, that's a similar mm. pro proposition regarding Europe. How do we go about encouraging um, investors to be more global in their investment? plates in a sense of where they're investing rather than being Eurocentric and, and UK centric? Yeah, I think um, it's always worthy to look beyond your geographical region. Uh, I completely understand it because people tend to have home bias because they know the companies, they understand better. Uh, but actually, uh, there, there are so many opportunities out there and actually it's much more easier accessible now, right, compared to the past, you know, with uh, the, the platforms and the opportunities offered by by various portfolio. Um, so uh, I think, uh, like, take, take the current situation as an example, right? Like, I know the markets have fallen, but if you have hold US assets, actually the dollar strength is actually quite helpful. So you get some sort of diversification from the currency as well. Um, so, yeah, I think looking beyond your domestic bias is it's like outside of your comfort zone again a lot of research needs to be done if you're uncomfortable again seek professional advice there are lots of opportunities out there and there are experts who can select the right investment for you and always believe in diversification not just the geographical diversification but it's also from a currency perspective, it, it is actually very helpful, for example, in the, in the current scenario. Uh, but I understand that people may not be comfortable doing that. So again, I would say, if you're not comfortable, always seek professional advice. Brilliant. Now, I've, I've got a concluding question for you. I just wanted you to share uh, with us, really, and for investors, the, the potential um, for long-term investment and why they should always persist with long-term investing, if you may. Yeah, so, so there are many benefits of long-term investing. So first of all, um, as I mentioned, typically an economy grows, uh, typically at 2% uh, for developed markets, and you add typically 2% inflation. So nominally, you get, for example, 4 to 5% nominal growth every year. So typically, your company earnings will be that. And typically, that's kind of the returns that you could be anticipating. So it's much better than leaving your money in the bank. Uh, I'm staying on average, like typically. Um, and always, you saw these cycles, right? Um, you see market tank, but you always see markets recover. You can see in the very long-term charts of any stock market, right? So I think that's very important. And of course, you have the benefit of compounding dividends, right? So if you invest in uh, company stocks, uh, if you invest in an index, for example, the UK, for example, offers you uh, one of the highest dividend yields uh, in the global markets. And those dividend yields actually, it compounds over time and is very, very powerful. It gives you a total return. You're not only getting the price return, you get the dividends. And over time, we all know the magic of compounding. It really, the longer you invest, the more powerful those compounding is. 
So if you're young, it, it is really, really powerful if you start young. You know, there are many figures that we can cite, you know, it is scientifically and statistically proven that it, it is a very powerful driver of return. Um, and I think, you know, long term wise, we all know there's inflation. I mean, right now inflation is rampant, but there's always inflation, right? Uh, whether you talk about 2%, 3%, if you leave your money in the bank, you, you will erode your real spending power anyway. I'd much rather to put my money in, in a broad index, for example, or in a portfolio that gives me that nominal GDP growth linked return than possibly you know, close to zero interest rate. I know that interest rates are rising at the moment. The bank is not going to pass through all that interest rate increase to your deposit account. So you're always going to get... Um, uh, your interest rate that is lagging inflation rate. So you will lose your real uh, spending power over time, over many years. That's, again, very powerful. If you look at the long-term uh, chart of the real value of 100 pounds over a year, it's amazing how much value you lose over the, the course of, say, uh, 20, 30 years. Um, so... There are many charts that I, mean, I can't show you here, but there are many charts, many statistics that show the power of investing over time. Uh, yeah, so it's scientific, actually, scientifically proven. Brilliant. I love that full response, Janet. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. Um, you. That was Janet Moy, the head of market analysis of Bruin Dolphin. Janet, thank you ever so much and wish you all the very best and all of your colleagues the very best going forward. And I look forward to speaking with you and meeting with you over at Nottingham at some point as well, if not in London. Take care. Yeah, thank you. God thank bless. you, Peter. Thank you.